and we will get started right now. I'm going to just highlight all of the changes that the latest tech note gave us. So one larger change is, well, we made two changes with visibility. First of all, we made it so that the visibility values are rounded to the nearest usable task or usable value in a task. Before, we would have, we get uh, 4SM, I'm sorry, we'd get 3SM or 5SM, but we could never get 4SM after we ran aviation finalized. But now, I mean, that's a, a whole number. So we allowed it and put it in there. And you won't see, like, mysterious rounding like that anymore. I will point out that we that the, the rounding is still there for cloud-based primary into the ceiling. Um, that actually happens in the task formatter. It takes, it rounds it for you. So I'm working on that in a later iteration of the formatter with GSD. All right, one more change that we made. We set the max visibility to 7SM in Conshort. Aviation finalized, once it ran, it already limited the, the max visibility to 7SM. So now Conshort is consistent with that as well. We did this to help us get a more consistent picture. Some models put 10 SM as the max, and others put 7, and Conshort was 10, and Aviation Finalized was 7. And we ended up, just because of how NDFD graphics are with the colors, 10 was white, 7 was green. If everything is just maxed out at 7, we have a consistent color. And you can see this all across the region now, since all of the offices have implemented the, um, the tech note. The, let's see, I skipped a slide earlier. With the tech note, you also got an updated task formatter. It was actually from back on May 31st. There hasn't been a new one since. I expect that to change very soon. I expect them to re release a new task formatter very soon. We've been working to, as a, a national team to uh, give suggestions and improvements. And that won't be released until January or maybe February, just because of the holiday moratorium. Uh, we did, there were a couple bug fixes with that. And then also the default weather rules, we changed them across Central Region. We have them totally excluding Prob 30 groups. Um, there was a lot of feedback with the last Task formatter version with the last weather rules saying, how do I get rid of Prop 30s? My office has a policy where we don't use them. And that seemed to be the majority of it. So now we just made that the default, no Prop 30s. If you want to make changes, your office still can. And there's plenty of documentation out there for it. I will go over where that documentation is toward the end of the presentation. All right. This was a storm that happened um, November 27th to 28th, just this past weekend. I screen captured these NDFD images right from our AWIPS box. Um, they're available in AWIPS. And if you, if you go directly to this presentation, which will be shared with everyone after the talk, you'll see the, the link that you can um, copy into Firefox into your AWIPS station. But look at the really clean picture. All of Central Region starts with con short as a default. Now, whether or not offices are making changes to it, that's up to the individual offices still. But as you can see, this starting as a with con short as a starting point, it's really great in IFR situations, and it gives us a really consistent picture in NDFD. We're very pleased with these results, and I hope that you are too. I hope you can see the value. This is just this. The one picture on the right is visibility. Picture on the left is ceiling height. And it was a tough forecast situation aviation-wise for many, many offices. There is a way to view some other models. And it's, uh, it's been recently shared with us from headquarters. And you need your username which is your email address without the at NOAA.gov, and then your 
your um, password for it to get in. The web address is at the top, also, also shared in the notes section of this presentation. And what it is, is uh, you can view what the National Blend of Models is forecasting for um, ceiling height and visibility. This will give you a feel for what's available or what we have to look forward to in the near future. If we have time at the end of the call, I can go more into this and kind of demonstrate the website to you. I'd like to keep moving, though, in this presentation. Like I alluded to, there are the new default weather rules. Notice there are no Prop 30s. Remember that weather rules read what's in your weather string. It does not read the, the pops. Even though I put the pops in these tables, um, it's reading chance or scattered, likely categorical, or I mean definite, something like that. It can't read your pops. And it treats thunderstorms separately from the rest of precip types. And so that is how these tables are designed and set up. If you did want to modify your weather rules, your local office can do that using the definition file. And there is documentation on this. I'll show you where that is. All right, with the, with the latest tech note, we gave you some more tools. All right, there is a smart tool that uh, we actually, I mean, we discovered, somebody shared it with us, um, a great central region coordination here. But we've tr tracked down the, the original creator of it. It was originally developed by Pat Moore at Greenville Spartanburg, and it was called Low Cloud Height. Uh, we didn't make very many modifications to it. Or we didn't make any at all, except we changed the title of it and called it Cloud Base from CCL and LCL. We found, we at MKX, using it the past six months, have found that it works better than cloud-based from RH tool for diurnal cumulus situations. The best part of it is that it picks up on the cloud or the convective condensation level. And um, the CCL is basically telling you what the height of a cloud base would be if clouds are going to develop due to positive buoyancy alone, basically the definition of diurnal Q. CCL is almost or is always higher than the LCL, and CCL seems to make a lot more sense in the diurnal Q situations in our experience. You may also run this tool for LCL, and that would be like if you're expecting some sort of forced ascent like along a front or a convergence boundary or maybe some orographic lift, the LCL might come in handy for you for deciding a, a lower cloud base than even what con short can give you. Um, con short is picking up on model ceiling, not necessarily model cloud bases. So um, in order to access this tool just by itself, because it, it has some built-in options for you, you can see, you can choose what individual models you want it to run, it, which run of those models, if you want to lift it from the, per, or the surface or the boundary layer, and what you want to do with higher other clouds. There's a lot built into this tool. If you want to run it, it's actually just a smart tool. It's not a procedure. So you can't use it from your procedure or populate menu. You have to either right-click on your cloud-based primary forecast grid map, or it's also available in that edit action dialog box. But wait, there's more. So what Jerry did is he um, he decided, no, he uh, put several tools together into one. I may have requested it. And we decided, we made a tool where you can run, you can choose if you want the aviation cloud-based from RH, or if you want the um, cloud-based from LCL, CCL. How do you do each of those tools? And then how can you decide which field to populate it into? Do I want to put it in the cloud-based primary? Do I want to put it in cloud-based secondary or cloud-based conditional? Uh, this tool that says it's 
under the populate menu, it's a procedure, it says aviation cloud-based from. You get to wrap all these tools together into one and you can choose what you want to populate. It's very slick and it can be run on its own or it's tied into aviation populate, which I'll get into in just a second. With this particular, this part of the tool, you can choose if you want to, which model you want to use, which run you want to use, and then be able to populate, and if you want CCL, LCL, or the one from RH. One thing to note here is that um, when you run, when you run that cloud base from LCL and CCL by itself as a smart tool, it takes a really long time on for each grid. So it's because it's doing a lot of calculations. So what Jerry did with this latest tech note is he made smart Init's for RAP, NAM, and GFS, and he put those into a consensus of short term, so ConShort. So you can have ConShort cloud-based TCL and ConShort cloud-based LCL. Um, it's not available. You, you don't have a ConShort for the cloud-based from RH. That wasn't done. There's So the, the difference here is that the smart Inets are all computed from what the default settings were in that tool. So if you want to deviate from those default settings, you'd probably have to run the tool. But if you're okay with those default settings, running this procedure is, um, would perform much faster because it's using what has already been pre-calculated pre in, in the smart Inets. And, uh, and then you can also get the same blending aspect as what is in ConShort. Now the RAP is weighted a little bit stronger since it's updating hourly and um, is more of a short-term model. And so I weighted that a little bit stronger in ConShort um, than what the NAM 12 and GFS one hour is. And what also is very cool is in your Weather Elements browser, you can pull up the RAP, NAM, and GFS and just see what they're doing as well as looking at ConShort. So you, got, you get your individual comparison. It's pretty nice. It was so nice that we wrapped it in right into Aviation Populate. All right, you're used to the top part of this. Um, Jerry added it into the bottom part of the Aviation, into the tool of Aviation Populate. And so this is just one slick way that you can handle diurnal queue um, without kind of opening up separate tools and all that. And it's just a one-stop shop. And we are going to go into exactly why we did it, and then we're going to talk about, well, we're going to add about the ceiling, because the models are doing ceiling. Yeah. So basically, what, what's happening here is why we're concentrating so much on this diurnal queue problem is really your feedback. A lot of people have been saying that ConShort doesn't handle diurnal queue very well. And so we're trying to help you guys solve that problem and give you the opportunity of, you know, going through your typical population um, process while also handling diurnal queue at the same time. And the reason why ConShort really does struggle with the diurnal queue is because the model that it's using don't forecast diurnal queue. They forecast ceiling. And diurnal queue isn't necessarily a ceiling. It can be scattered and few. And so it, that isn't really what these models are trying to forecast. And so what we are trying to forecast with diurnal queue really is a cloud base. And that's what cloud base primary is mainly meant for. And so that, that's the whole idea behind this and why we're, we're trying to help everybody out with this forecast process. All right, so how to do it. First of all, run it with your default configuration first. When you pull up Aviation Populate, just hit Run. Don't hit Run Dismiss. Hit Run, then the window will stay open. Then go into the time period that you think you're going to have a diurnal queue. And, or, or just lower sub basic club, lower cloud basis. It doesn't have to be diurnal queue. We're calling it that because it helps, but this is just making a lower cloud base for any reason that you're seeing in, for, in observations. 
All right, so there's three things you need to select. You select only diurnal cue elements from this top box. What happens here is that anything else checkmarked will just be ignored. All right, so only diurnal cue elements ignores everything else. Yes, you would like to use a selected time range. And yes, you want it to be a diurnal cue day or a lower cloud-based day or whatever. Then you can make whatever extra selections you'd like. Tell it which, which uh, grid to populate and what you want it to use. You have the option of selecting the time period using your slider bar. I personally think it's easier to just highlight your selected time range. And then I'm just going to give you a little example here. Here's what uh, the con short gave me when I loaded in in, in cloud-based primary. It gave me a lot of 250s. Let's just assume this is a situation where we have um, broken to overcast, probably broken high cloud cirrus overhead. Your, your METARs are giving you, um, say, scattered 6,000 and overcast um, 250, 25,000. All right, so what I'm going to do is run it by default first, and then I'm going to go back, make my, make my selections. I only highlighted one, one hour here for demonstration, but I selected only diurnal queue elements, use selected time range, yes, diurnal queue day, and I wanted it to populate cloud-based secondary because I wanted to make a lower cloud-based but still conserve the main um, the main cloud-based primary, the one that kind of reads your sky grid. And so then what it comes up with, say for Milwaukee, in the TAF, it's going to go one category lower than what your sky grid is. So if I had broken 250 and it'd be scattered 060, broken 250 in the TAF. That's how it would read it since I have a cloud-based secondary grid showing up here. And it would just be for that one time period because that's the only grids that I had populated. One hour, I should say. All right, so we'll take questions at the end. If you want me to go back to it, I'd love to help with that. All right, so Jerry has been busy adding some new models, and that's been showing up in the last two tech notes. So this is his opportunity to highlight what kind of new models we all get to see and how it can help us with um, cloud-based primary and visibility. All right, so I think the GLAMP MEL came out maybe in not this latest tech note, but the tech note before, but just to reiterate what it is, it's a blend of the HRRR and GLAMP, and they basically redeveloped the process with those two models and created GLAMP MEL. It's one of actually the top verifying models. It's beating kind of short in a lot of cases, and because of that, um, I actually increased the, the weight of GLAMP MELD, as you can see here by the bold, um, it's now four times the weight. So it's a pretty substantial weight um, in, in the overall spectrum of the models. Um, I've also added what's called the GFS one hour. Now, the one hour might be a little bit misleading. You might be thinking it's a different GFS. It's actually the same exact, exact GFS that um, you guys are getting. Um, and have been getting for quite a while. It's a 20 kilometer GFS. Um, the difference is with the 20 kilometer GFS that you see in AWIPS, um, they actually post process out data that we would normally get um, or that we could get. So GFS is actually run at I think like 15 minute time steps. I could be wrong there, but I know it's actually run pretty small. And all they're really out, all they were outputting for us is the three hour data and the six hour data after like 36 or 72 hours. So now they're actually posting one hour data to another site which Matt Foster at Region um, is grabbing for us and then hosting. So what you should see is that the three hour time steps, the GFS one hour should be exactly the same. Um, but now you're getting hourly data. So it's still the same six, you know, six hour time or six hour cycles and you're just getting the one hour data out of 36 hours. So that, that's a huge help for Con Short. Um, it should be a whole lot less fragmented, especially in the pop grids. 
Um, and then I've also added, and we've had this here at Milwaukee for quite some time, but now with the increased bandwidth that we're getting, we were able to finally get it out to the rest of the field. Um, so now you're getting hourly high-res ARW and NMM data. Um, there is currently a problem with the, the dew points. We're actually not getting the dew point data for that. Um, there's an open ticket for this, and it should be closed in the NWS and its config here within um, hopefully a, uh, the next couple weeks. We're going to try to get it out before the holiday moratorium to get those TDs back in there. Um, ops model, it's, um, that has always been available, sort of. Um, it, was, it was computed within ConShort. Um, and it's how ConShort sort of used the ops database. So some of the elements are infected elements like sky and pop. Other elements use a diurnal curve sort of like for temperature and dew point um, over the past seven days to determine what the, the ops are going to be. And so this way we can actually start verifying um, how those are, are performing. And what I'm seeing is, you know, for elements like cloud-based primary, we may actually be including that OBS model too far out because it's not verifying very well past the second and third hour. Um, so we may be adjusting con short um, to actually eliminate some of that OBS presence um, in some of those in cycle in some of those hours. And then con short SD, this is a new model. Um, it's it stands for standard deviation. A lot of offices have been saying um, there are models that perform consistently bad or some models just don't do very well. And the idea here is I'm trying to adjust the mean um, by throwing out outliers. So if there's a model that has, out, that has outlying grid points, this is done by grid point by grid point, um, it's those outlying grid points could be thrown out with the standard deviation. Um, one caveat here is um, I require that there's at least four models going into the, no, five models going into the blend. So a lot of times you may see that the Contour SD is very, or looks exactly the same as Contour, and that may be because there's only five models going into the blend. But if there's more, then I trust what I'm getting from, you know, the distribution, and so then I'll use that standard deviation and throw out some of those outlying grid points and recompute that blend. So this is something that, you know, it's optional, it was optional in the tech note. Um, you may want to talk to your um, GSE focal point or IPO to see if it was installed. Um, it's something that I would like to get feedback on and see how it's performing. Here at MKX, it seems to be performing pretty well. We'll show verification here in a little bit, and it does seem to be performing very well. Um, so we may actually change what Consort is to use this outlier sort of um, approach with the Consort SD. All right, thanks, Jerry. And if you're wondering what the weights are in Consort for which elements, I did make a table. It's a spreadsheet, and it is linked in here. And you'll be have access to this talk um, soon. So anyway, then you can click on the link and find out the composition of Consort for each element. All right, so speaking of, veri of verification, um, I pulled this off a few days ago from MKX, and this is a 60-day cloud-based primary verification. Basically, this is showing that the forecasters are ranking one, number one for most of the first part of the task period. This is encouraging. It means that forecasters can and do add value when they're editing, because MKX is operational. We are taking a close look at what Consort gives us and making some modifications as necessary. Um, you can also use this to view what else is doing well. As Jerry said, GLAMP Meld is excelling. Um, and then Consort is also doing well. Consort time lag, not everyone has, but Consort standard deviation is all available to you. Notice the percentages here, or the, the values of the high key scores are very, very, very similar. We're talking thousands off. So all of these models are doing very well. Did you want to add anything, Jerry? Um, 
So what, this is sort of what I was alluding to. If you look at what this saying with the worst guidance, um, how it shows the op model dead last, um, that, you know, that, that, that was eye-opening to me. And I'm actually going through um, other sites now that there's this verification for ops model and looking to see how it's verifying at other sites. So um, that, that's one of the reasons why um, I wanted that in there. And it's also showing to me that just leaving in old data um, is one of those, there's always this argument that we should stick with previous. And by looking at ops model, that, that really is showing what the ops are doing and saying that they are changing. We can't just use what was previously in there. And so doing updates and more frequent updates really does pay dividends. And I think that's one of the reasons why we see that the forecasters here at MKX really are improving on, on the guidance because they're taking a look. They're always looking at this data and utilizing what the, the guidance is giving them and improving on it. They've learned it and they've done a really good job. And I mean, it's, it's very obvious when you're looking at these stats that in these first six hours, um, they're, they're really, they're, they're doing their job. So it's, it's something that they should all be pretty proud of. All right, so moving on to um, possibly a hot topic, sore subject, I don't know what to say, but a lot of you, there are 10 offices in Central Region that are doing a full-blown experiment with Forecast Builder, a test bed. Everyone else um, starts with Forecast Builder grids in the background and are not required to use the weather editing part of it. But anyway, the, the thing is with Central Region and you know, projected to the rest of the country at some point, it sounds like, Forecast Builder is going to be a really big integral part of our forecast process. Now, right now, Forecast Builder is not in the short term. It's not in the ESTF time period. Um, that's all fine and dandy. I'm sure that will change. And also, when we are, when we are working, MKX is part of the test bed office, and the first thing that about five forecasters came up to me and said, Marsha, how do I get Forecast Builder to use my visibility grids, and um, how do I make digital aviation work with Forecast Builder? Right now, they're um, kind of two separate things. And I want to assure you that the CRG mat is uh, on, is, is on it, all right? They're, they're working very hard to get digital aviation incorporated into Forecast Builder. One thing, one idea they're throwing around is maybe making visibility, at least, part of the foundation grids. I think the hardest part we've been handling with handling this fall is how to handle fog, because Forecast Builder uses a tool that looks for small dew point depressions, low winds, that kind of thing. It has nothing to do with your visibility grid. Um, when you try to, when you use visibility grids to create where your fog is, there's no check built in there to make sure your dew point depressions are small enough to be realistic, or that the winds, you know, if it's not an advection situation, your winds might be a factor. So we're working with those two. We're trying to get something to merge those two tools together. We've got to make a new tool, and that hasn't been developed yet. This is, you know, it's kind of a, a task. Also, we're going to be, or what is slated for January is to kind of build some of the components from Aviation Populate and Aviation Finalize into Forecast Builder. All of these are still in the works. If you have suggestions, please talk to the Forecast Builder development team. Send your feedback through the forms, through email, through VLAB. We would really appreciate input. Thank you. All right. And I just want to go over one more thing. This comes up in emails about every other week. Someone is saying, hey, aviation finalized didn't work for me, or it skipped something, and, or it wiped out my visibility. Why did it do that? So let's just review a couple of the things that are built into aviation finalized. All of this is in documentation, and I'll tell you where that is in a second. All right, so no, rule number one, you're only editing the cloud-based primary grids. 
you are not touching the ceiling grids. Cloud-based secondary, cloud-based conditional, they're optional. Cloud-based cloud conditional actually is not handled very well in the TAF former, formatter yet, still experimental. Cloud-based secondary does pretty well. Anyway, only edit your cloud-based primary grids. Aviation Finalize will interpolate any missing grids also, but it will create your ceiling grids. Don't touch your ceiling grids. The ceiling grids are what are sent to NDFD. Your cloud-based primary grids are what the task formatter reads. The Aviation Finalize is built to make sure everything is consistent between your sky cover and your cloud-based primary, and that is what creates your ceiling. Um, there, in addition, here's the other gotcha for Aviation Finalize, it seems. Visibility, a lot of checks are built into Aviation Finalize. You might have low visibility in your grids from con shorts or you hand editing the visibility grids, and that's great. But if you don't have any fog or weather that has like at least likely or higher weather in your grids, your visibility is going to be wiped out from the QC checks that are built into Aviation Finalized. If you like your visibility, your lower visibility that you put in there, make sure you select yes in this fog from visibility. Okay, then you have options for limiting your patchy area widespread, whatever. But that has to say yes, and then it will add your fog to your grid, to your weather grid. Um, and like I said, if you have a chance of showers or chance of thunderstorms in a low visibility, that's not good enough. Finalize is reading your weather grid, not your pops, and it's looking for likely, numerous, definite, that kind of thing, your high pop type um, weather. That's what it's looking for. If you have any questions on that, I'd love to answer them. All right, so all of you are aware of this CR Docs toolbox. It's been shared numerous times. It's available on VLAB. It's uh, been passed around in the link to the digital, this, uh, this phone call right now. The link is right there. All your recordings are available in this toolbox. Any um, older training materials that I've written up, I've stick them in this older CR DOS materials folder. Otherwise, you've got your a status spreadsheet here. There's a whole overview document. It's meant to be like how to do everything and explanations for all the tools. Um, why, are, why are they done? What processes are are run in the background of Aviation Finalized. It's all spelled out into this CR DOS overview document. Um, there is an update document that accompanied the tech note. And um, so this document I'd love for you to read out, read over, but it's also stuck into the CR DOS overview image, um, document. Um, I kind of keep like a highlight of the updates in this presentation here. And then uh, the five presentations you see here, they are, they're still fairly current, but I do plan on refreshing them. They, they outdate because we keep making extra changes. So I plan on delving into that and, and making it a, a little more updated. Also, we do plan on making some job sheets in the near future. That'll help. Um, that'll kind of be tied in with some forecast builder, but I want to I want to add a little bit more specific training. I know that there was a training doc shared with all the the DOS development email list um, from the Raleigh office, and and that document is very nicely done. It has a lot of screen captures and step by step, but I want to I want to um, highlight that. The training document that is very relevant, relevant to how each and every office does it in central region is this one, the CR DOS overview. Just refer to that document. That will tell you how central region process works. And also, um, in that presentation, it, it highlighted how to edit individual task sites. Remember that we are doing digital aviation services grids all over your entire CWA. 
we're not trying to focus on past sites. This is for for the greater good. So um, just keep keep an open mind. Obviously, you do have to write your tasks from your grids, so you'll probably focus your eyes onto those sites more, those areas. But please edit grids for your entire area. Um, now I will open this up to questions. Brian, are there any questions posted? And then if you do have a question, please raise your hand in, in, the, in the webinar. Yes, very good. Um, we do have one question. Um, uh, Thomas, are, are you available to take that question? I will unmute your line and you are unmute. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, my question was just regarding uh, tempo groups in, in later periods. Is that, I'm trying to remember if that's uh, something the directives allow beyond a certain um, time range. Because I think that, that had burned me in the past where I was using the formatter and uh, someone correctly pointed out that I shouldn't have tempos in the, in the last six hours of the forecast. Is there any um, uh, QC check on that for the formatters? Okay, I don't, I don't know the answer to your question right offhand. I know this has come up in the past, and I've had an answer. I really can't remember exactly what it is. Um, I believe the directive ad advises that we keep tempo groups limited to the, to the short term, but I don't think it's specific. The specific part of the directive states that Prop 30s must be limited to the first nine hours. Okay. Now is there no, maybe? No, I'm sorry. Prop 30s are limited to beyond the first nine hours. Yeah, I said that wrong. Okay. Is there maybe like a, a configuration setting that could be uh, that could make that adjustment for for maybe local office policy? I can request that as one of the features to be added to a future build for the task formatter. But if we have to check. I mean, I don't think it's illegal in the directives. Yeah, I, I guess I was just thinking in terms of, you know, local partners, what their preferences are, having right. that option. Encourage. Um, I know Cammie's on the phone, and uh, she would, she might be able to chime in here. Brian, is there any way you could unmute Cammie's line? Brian, do you have any success with unmuting Cammie's line? All right, we'll keep working on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yes, I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> uh, Cammie, uh, I need you to put in your, uh, your pin so that we can... Uh, uh, oh, she line. said she did, but actually she chatted me the answer, so um, I will answer it from the directive's point of view. The directives state that tempos need to be in the, within the first nine hours and Prop 30s after nine hours. All right, so that is that's the directive, and what you are saying is that your TAF formatter is allowing tempo groups beyond nine hours and um, we will have to address that because it should not go against the directive. Okay, yeah, thanks. That was, that was my understanding. Okay, thank you very much, Cami, also for chiming in on that. Um, she said, also she added that the latest task formatter um, was the latest release that's in a practice directory was released on November 8th. So that is a new formatter is in the works and will be disseminated after uh, the 
the national team gets time to test it. Okay, very okay. good. Um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Lockhart, uh, you had your hand raised. I've unmuted your, your line. Uh, do you have a question? Um, I didn't. I was just going to uh, uh, go over what was already covered on, on what was in the directive according to the tempo. So that's already been covered. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot for adding that. And that will help with our consistencies as well, is what Cami added. Thanks, Jeff. Um, are there any other questions at this time? Oh, very good. I see no hands raised. Um, Marcia, if you'd like. I just wanted to add a couple more things. Is that all right, Brian? Yes, if you'd like to take, uh, 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 take control, all lines are mute. All right, cool. Um, remember that we do have a VLAB site, and we welcome your feedback. There, is, there are instructions on how to get into VLAB here, and I encourage you to go in and check it out. All the documentation is also available there. Um, as I alluded to at times during the talk, and Patrick Eide from the CRG MAT, um, the, the Central Region Grid Methodology Advisory Team, will chime in on kind of some future, future, future stuff with digital aviation services. But um, just I want to highlight that GSD is working on the national level to get um, to get some national standardized set of tools available to the whole country. They're going to incorporate the central region tools, and they're going to take the good things out of the rest of the country and incorporate it into things we're going to use. So please watch for those in the future. Um, we're working on the development team of that, and that's exciting that we'll all be on the same page. All right. Um, one more thing we're going to try to get in in a future iteration of the task formatter is we've been having some problems with low-level wind shear showing up. like. It's, interp it's interpolated in the outer periods um, by a con short. It, it has an interpolation. So let's say you go from zero low-level wind shear up to 30 knots of low-level wind shear in, in GFE. So in the interpolation section, people are ending up with 10 knots of low-level wind shear that's showing up in the TAF formatter. All right, well, we don't show things for 10 knots for low-level wind shear that's below our threshold of shearing. So we're going to be working with the formatter developers, GSD, on um, giving us a, a limiting threshold for that. Uh, so we're working on the cloud-based or the diurnal queue thing. We're look, working on rounding and cloud-based primary stuff. Um, the National Blender Model, phase three, that's going to have our ceiling and visibility grids. That one, by design, should be able to handle diurnal queue just a little bit better, or a lot better than con short by design. So Jerry's going to add something to that. So what they're doing with the national blend of models um, for ceiling is actually they're going to be producing two grids for us. They're going to have one that's going to be a true ceiling grid and another one that's going to be a cloud-based grid. So the idea is we would actually in the field be populating mainly with the cloud-based grid, since this is the grid that we would be needing to edit, and then our ceilings would be generated from the cloud-based, the final cloud-based grid, and the sky cover grid, just like we are currently doing. So the hope there is that there that the cloud-based grid that they are creating um, will do a little bit better with these diurnal queue events. That'll actually give us a good-looking cloud base. Um, they have some initial results out, and um, we're hoping that maybe in the January um, or February time frame, we may be able to actually get these into um, AWIP so that people can start looking at them and maybe offering some feedback. Um, the eventual goal here is that, you know, Conshore is sort of our stopgap. Um, we don't really have a good blended model right now. So that's why Contour was created. So eventually we would like to switch over to using what's in the national blend of models. So that's, um, that's where we're going with this. And so we're hoping that the national blend of models will succeed. All right. And then, uh, Patrick, did you want to say something um, about the future future? 
And Patrick, you are on mute. Okay, right. Uh, everyone hear me? Or someone? Just to make yep, sure. I can hear you. Okay, sounds good. Uh, uh, Marcia, uh, thank you for all your work and, and the good presentation, and, and Jerry as well, of uh, certainly providing all the technological power behind all this, um, uh, not only uh, digital aviation, but also the, the other uh, GFE efforts across the region. You know, looking long term, especially as we look off to uh, FY18 and 19, uh, there, there's kind of three prong challenges uh, that um, we're going to have to figure out um, as we chart ahead. The first is um, is what's been alluded to a little bit already is dealing with uh, digital aviation and forecast builder, its integration and you know moving forecast builder. How does it, how do we evolve it to the uh, ESTF process? So that's uh, that's challenge number one. Uh, challenge number two is um, how do we continue to evolve DAS from where we currently are um, to where we want it to be, um, where we are would maybe down the road um, all amendments are, are going out of out of um, GFE, where where our grids are, are on the NDFD and our amendments are not just you know we're not just focused on the TAF sites but we're also you know amending for areas in, in between the TAF sites as a, as a long-term vision. Uh, so how do we get there and how do we get there in, in, a, um, in a fashion that is not too quick but, but not too slow at the same time? Part of that uh, is also the third part of this is um, AWC. Um, as we move uh, forward with them, um, as they will, especially in FY 18 and 19, be uh, building up their, their, capa their, their digital aviation capability and guidance that they would be uh, sending to us. Um, that also plays in the role with NBM, with integrated field structure, all those components long term, especially as we uh, look off to more of an FY1819 um, horizon. And there's um, different ways that Central Region does things compared to the way that AWC is currently uh, producing things uh, based on their requirements by the FAA. Um, so how do those jive together is, is another thing that, that we're working with uh, AWC closely on, um, especially as we move uh, further down the road. So that kind of casts a, a long-term vision. You know, there's a lot of challenges, uh, obviously. Uh, none of them are, are insurmountable, uh, but certainly things that we're going to be, be taking a look at from a CRG map standpoint, from a, a CR digital aviation community standpoint um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, that, that's kind of cast the, the long-term term vision of where we need to go and uh, and how we're going to get there is uh, where we are working on those solutions. All right, thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, Brian, Brian has been busy making, uh, kind of updating our, our digital aviation services status spreadsheet. And uh, so if you haven't gone to it lately, um, just maybe go to it, the link is in, in this presentation, and share how your office is doing, where you are, are you testing or operational, and uh, add some more information as, as you can. Yes, very good. Um, I'll just speak to that uh, quickly. When we uh, uh, set up the original spreadsheet, uh, we knew that it was all uh, kind of a, a learning process and it was very much um, uh, under development. But uh, now I think we're far enough along that we'd, we'd like to see um, some real stages in terms of uh, uh, where you're at, whether whether you, uh, the, well, there are many that are operational right now. And so we'd like to start gathering those dates um, as to when you are operational or b became operational, and even um, uh, when you plan to. Um, so if we can start uh, uh, start populating with kind of new, more definite terms, uh, that will help us uh, better communicate where we are uh, uh, nationally to, uh, uh, to headquarters. Um, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll send a reminder out um, uh, and ask for these more specific rankings now that we're we're uh, we're getting uh, uh, almost a year now since we uh, began this process. Uh, 
Okay. Well, thanks, Brian. That's actually all I had. So, if um, we'll, you know, we'll we'll stay on the line for a few more minutes to take questions, and otherwise, Brian, go ahead. Okay. Um, I did see one more hand uh, raised, uh, Jeff. Um, I have uh, unmuted your line. Did you have a question? I wanted to go back and revisit the uh, low-level wind shear a little bit. Um, in our office, with the uh, uh, loading the con short, which is I think what we pretty much do in the uh, short term and with the aviation, that's our good starting point there. Um, we found that uh, it really gives us a good heads up of when we may want to consider putting low-level wind shear in the task where uh, we previously may not have considered it. And that seems to be, uh, works fairly well with uh, conditions you would normally expect where we get our southerly low-level jet developing uh, at night and also uh, in a very short-term period with uh, cold frontal passage. It's, it's been giving us some pretty good heads up with that. Um, some problems we've been seeing with that um, have been uh, the low-level wind shear grids seem to be, um, I guess the best way to put it is peaking in extent uh, as far as our coverage across areas at uh, three hourly increments and then being interpolated between those three hourly uh, landmark times. Um, I guess the question is, is that a, uh, uh, an artifact of the model data being in, incorporated into the con short and is there a way to fix that? And then also uh, in our TAP formatter, it seems to always put our uh, low-level wind shear height at 2,000 feet and never anything lower. And that's something we have to adjust manually. Um, are we doing something wrong with that or is that something also that's going to change in the future? Hey, Jeff, we'll let uh, Jerry chime in here on that one. So the one level wind shear has been a bit of a headache for me. Um, the the actual tool was developed, I believe, by Matt Belk at Boston. Um, I adopted that tool um, and put it into Conshore, and I made some minor modifications um, just to improve the way it computed, like how, the speediness of how it computed things. Um, but I didn't really change the overall calculations. I believe, and I've I've looked at this off and on that there is an error with where it's getting the heights from because I've noticed that too, that it's very rare to get anything other than 2,000. I've probably only seen it once, maybe twice. Um, I know I did some adjustments um, back, I believe, in October on it, and I think I, I, I did find a couple bugs, um, and, I, and I corrected those. Um, Another thing that's going to help is that now I'm using the GFS one-hour data. Um, so I'm not doing an interpolation on those off hours for the GFS. So we're getting, you know, some more of that, at least in the, you know, shorter time frame. Um, in, you know, out in that longer, I think it's past 30 hours or so, I, I, I split it out to going every three hours. Um, and then, then there's that interpolation deal. Um, it's possible that we could, now that we have the GFS out that far, um, that we may actually, I may actually get rid of that and just do it hourly out through the 36-hour time frame. Um, and I think that might also help with some of these interpolation issues. So those are some of the things I'm working on. Um, I think GSD is trying to work on a more all-encompassing low-level wind shear tool. Um, and so at some point, right now, a lot of, you know, on the national side, people are sort of looking at Central Region as being rogue, but our, our goal is to actually help the national thing and drive what's going on at GSD. So we're going to eventually try to get our tools incorporated over there, and then the install scripts will actually point to their repositories versus our repositories. So eventually, we won't be using our tools, we'll be using their tools, and hopefully some of these low-level wind shear issues will sort of correct their, themselves once we're able to switch over to the GSD version. Okay, great. We'll look for a continual improvement then. And by all means, you know, I'm the kind of person that I like to see things, and I can never see enough. 
So if you find problems, please send them along. Send me snapshots about you know what you don't think is right with the low-level wind shear grids, and that a lot of times helps me. I mean, I, I'm only at MKX, and I can't really you know see what's going on everywhere else. And I you know we only you, low-level wind shear isn't something that always happens. We're in more of a low-level wind shear season now, but um, you know it's it's something that. You know, it's one of those grids that I can only fix it if I see it. So uh, please send me send me snapshots or whatever, and I'm happy to look at it. Okay, thanks. I'll probably end up doing that. Uh, I think we tend to get more low-level wind shear here than uh, what most people think we get. So it's been a good heads up so far. Uh, but if I start inundating your inbox, definitely tell me to, to trim it down because I may end up doing that. That's fine. Please send me. All right. Thanks. Oh, those are great. Those are great comments. Um, if you do see something that's broke, it's probably not just you. So go ahead and provide that uh, um, that feedback. Uh, we have uh, just two minutes left. Um, I don't see any hands for questions. So uh, rather than end early, because uh, I'd, I'd like to see if there are any more questions here today. Um, I'll ask a question. Uh, Marsha, can you go to slide 15? And of course that's verification and something that I've asked folks to uh, uh, to consider is um, that uh, these uh, these uh, uh, this page, this verification page provides quite a lot of information. Um, even for the uh, folks at your office who may be uh, not uh, uh, not interested in in uh, digital aviation from uh, right away, uh, they could at least be coming into here and taking a look to see where their forecasts rank and even what the best model guidance might be for them to be using. Um, right now, Marsha, we're looking at the verification page. I don't know if you're trying to click on, there you go. So we're looking at the. That everyone, it's available for everyone. And oh, this is how you get it. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. So we're looking at the live page and the live data, and we're going to embarrass uh, uh, Milwaukee because their numbers will probably be just shameful. <laughs> so you click on uh, aviation verification, and then on the say last ninety days, or last sixty days, whichever. I'll do sixty because we added added some new models within that 60 to 90 day period. So okay. if, if there's low amount of data, that seems to have a high ranking and it's error, error. So if you can scroll down so we see the entire page for everyone. Um, uh, Jerry or Marsha, would you care to explain, uh, explain what, uh, say, hours one through five might mean? And then right, uh, pick an hour where you don't do well at hour six and explain what, what I might, as a forecaster, take away from these. All right. Jerry's the statistical guy and came up with these tables, so he can explain it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just like what we had showed earlier. I think this is just, you know, obviously the latest data. But, I mean, hours one through five, the forecasters are picking and choosing when to improve on con short. Um, so over the past 60 days, they've – been doing pretty well with that. Um, and then in, you know, hour six through about 10, um, you know, this is where you're getting into sort of the middle of the forecast. And, you know, it's, it's not as, as much as a now cast, but more of uh, having to forecast more. And you might want to start trusting what the models are saying a little bit more in that situation. At least that's what um, this, this you know, past 60 days has been showing. Um, now this is a high key skill score. There's lots of different scores you can look at. Um, and so this high key is sort of a broad score of looking at lots of different um, thresholds. And if you go further down on the page, you can actually dig further into it and look at exactly where it's, you know, how the, the grids are breaking out. So at the six hour forecast, um, you might see that we actually are, it looks like we have sort of a high bias, that we're forecasting a little bit too high. Um, that's what the blue 
was saying. So uh, these are just ways you can sort of dissect the data and get into it, you know, down the road what you might think of. If, you know, in this situation, you might say, okay, if con short is going a little bit lower and I have a high bias, maybe I should trust con short. Um, so that, that's just ways that I could, that I would envision using it. I mean, in all honesty, when I'm looking at this data right now, if I see a lot of green, I'm thinking I'm doing pretty good. Um, the difference there between con short, or GLAMP meld and con short TL, which is the timeline version of con short, it, that's very minimal. That's like maybe or on the six hour time frame. Um, I mean, that's only a difference of six thousandths of a high key point. So, I mean, that might be one grid point over that 60 day period that is forcing that difference. So, you know, to me, these, these are all pretty good scores and, you know, I'm, I'm really happy and, I mean, when I first started this and first started this page, these scores were all much lower for the models as well as um, the forecasters. And the forecasters, when we first started this, this whole page was, or was red. They were never improving on the models, ever. And now they are. And, and it's, it's an artifact of the, them getting used to this, and that's why we're going down this path. And so Marsh is going to show, if you look at just the GLAMP model here, um, and I mean, this is outstanding verification. <laughs> um, and this is why the GLAMP meld is so high, highly um, weighted. And I'm, and I'm actually in thinking I might go with a higher weight um, for an upcoming tech note and maybe even give it six, because it, it is really going gangbusters, and it, it is one of the highest performing models. Um, you can also see here that Conshore SD is performing very well, and I, I anticipate that because of exactly why I created that standard deviation. You might have, you know, five models or six models saying that you're going to have low ceilings, and then one model with a high ceiling of 250 could drive up the Conshore, um, the Conshore ceilings or call base primary, and so you could throw out that 250 and it's going to have a pretty big impact on what the final um, grid is. So I'm, I'm really happy with this first results from Conshort SD and you know that probably will become Conshort at some point. Well, thank you, Jerry. That, that's, that's how I take uh, this too. Uh, this gives me maybe what models are working best at my sites um, and, it, and it also lets me if you scroll down as as you did um, during the discussion you can say well why is it that in the in the later hours um, you know maybe my verification isn't as good and you can look and say well I have a high bias or I have a low bias and it's it's just a quick way to look um, and I, th I think it's very specific. So um, if your folks have not looked at it, and I do call on aviation focal points, and sometimes they say, no, I really haven't looked at that. So if you haven't looked at it before, here's an opportunity um, uh, you know, for you to see it uh, here looking at Milwaukee's data, and then you can, you can go in and look at yours. Um, with that, I see no other hands raised. We will have another call on Monday. Uh, same time, uh, you will have to use a different uh, code, so please click um, uh, click on that. If uh, uh, if you try to use this code, I, I don't know where you'll be, but you'll probably be all by yourself in the room. Unless I see any hands raised, Marcia, do you have any final comments? Well, Jerry's pulling up one last screen, but I think... I was just showing people how easy they can go back and forth between sites. So if they're curious about how things are verifying at other sites, you can, I mean, pretty quickly go in and around and get to all the other sites. And um, we've tried to design this verification page, both the extended and the aviation, you know, the short-term stuff, so that you can see what all your neighbors are doing and how you're doing and compare. And, I mean, it, it, I know, you know, on the forecast shifts, looking at this verification might not be the most fun thing to do, but, you know, on a, 
RD shift or a time, sometime when you have a little bit of time to look at this, um, it might be worthwhile. All right, and I already had one question uh, uh, here. I don't know if they wanted to be outed. I've unmuted them, but they say, uh, how do I get to that verification web page? Um, so you can see it uh, listed at the top as a Google site. It's available from the VLAB, um, also f from the uh, uh, the CRG, MAT, um, uh, the grid methodology teams, uh, 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 VLAB and uh, their uh, their Google site. We will is it will it be linked from this. Uh, I have it right here in front of me. Is it is it linked from the presentation as well? Yep, it's right there in the bottom. Oh, I see it. It's in the notes. So keep in mind when Mar when Marcia sends this out, uh, or oh. I can send it out either way. Yeah, and this is going to be in the CR DOS toolbox. Yes, and so there. Just look in the uh, uh, in the presentation notes and the speaker notes, and that's the and the link is right there. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Well, very good. Thank you, everyone, uh, for this morning. Uh, we'll have another one, and uh, this will be recorded, and I will send that out as well. Thank you, everyone.